Barley, the first grain to ripen each spring in the land of Israel and an integral part of the Creator's reckoning of time. This barley has reached a stage in its development that the Hebrew scriptures refer to as Aviv. Beginning at sundown, we will diligently watch the skies over Jerusalem for the sign that will establish the Rosh Chodesh, the new month. When the first sliver of the new moon is sighted, this month will be declared the month of the Aviv barley, the beginning of the Creator's yearly calendar and the month in which we will celebrate the Feast of Passover. The ancient details involved in sighting and declaring the new moon and Aviv barley are filled with prophetic shadow pictures concerning the last days. Unless we understand these rehearsals, the book of Revelation will remain an indecipherable time warp continuum to the Western Gentile mind. Most people have grown up in ignorance of the very two things of which the Bible instructs do not be ignorant, God's times and seasons. I'm Michael Rood. Prepare for a rude awakening. In Rav Shaul's, the Apostle Paul's first letter to the followers of Yahshua in the city of Thessalonica, he writes, Concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. The Creator's times and seasons are two distinct concerns. The word seasons throughout the Hebrew Scriptures is from the Hebrew word moedim, literally appointed times, which are defined in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus as the Feast of the Lord. They are referred to as shadow pictures of good things to come in the Brit Hadashah or New Testament and sometimes mistakenly called Jewish holidays. The times of which Shaul speaks refer to the Creator's reckoning of time, which is clearly detailed in the Hebrew Scriptures. Why did Shaul indicate that there was no need for instruction on these things? Many of those first century followers of the Messiah lived by the Creator's reckoning of time and were instructed in the feast of the Lord from their youth. But at the time that Shaul's letter was written, no one could comprehend that in the future the entire world of commerce would be run on a pagan calendar. But 2,000 years ago, Rome ruled the world, and the empire began to force its calendar and its gods upon the people that they conquered. Fifty years after Shaul penned those words, the Roman general Titus destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem, which was soon renamed Capitolina. At that time, everything Jewish was annihilated, and Rome built temples to their gods on the ruins. But they were unable to destroy the faith that the dispersed remnant maintained in the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and in the Messiah. All Jews believed that the Messiah would come, and tens of thousands of Jews, including a multitude of priests, believed that he had already come and foretold this very event of the temple's destruction. 300 years after Shaul penned those words, the Emperor Constantine instituted a plan to absorb the followers of the Jewish Messiah into the mainstream of Roman society. He developed a new religious system that even the most committed sun god worshippers would find tolerable. First, Constantine forbade anything Jewish in his new religion and began to construct another Jesus, a paganized Messiah who would be completely acceptable to the heathen. Then he incorporated all the accoutrements of pagan sun god worship into this new religion and named himself Pontifex Maximus, the title of the high priest of paganism. In the year 326 of the Common Era, after Constantine's so-called conversion, he had this coin minted. On the obverse side is Constantine's image. On the reverse, we see the image of a man who has the whole world in his hands and a halo of the rays of the sun beaming from his face. Many will recognize Constantine's hero by his birth date, as it is recorded in the Encyclopedia Britannica, December 25th the day of the winter solstice on the ancient Babylonian calendar. Still a mystery? 
you will surely identify this deity by the inscription, Sola Invict to Committee, or Committed to the Invincible Son, Sol Invictus Mithra. Constantine, considered a founding father of the Christian church, was a worshiper of the Roman sun god, Sol Invictus Mithra, until the day he died. He had his wife and oldest son murdered and later immortalized himself as the reincarnation of the god Apollo. He placed his image on a pillar high above all the other gods in Constantinople. Lightning struck the image and the burnt column is still standing today, but without Constantine's charred image. The calendar that was used in the Roman Empire of Constantine's day was originally developed in Nimrod's Babylon. The sun calendar was adapted by Julius Caesar, updated by Pope Gregory fewer than 500 years ago, and has become the established method of reckoning time in the world of international commerce. The Gregorian calendar begins each day, week, month, and year at an arbitrary point in time, which was fabricated by those who were ignorant of the Creator's time clock. To understand the Creator's reckoning of time and His seasons, or festivals, we must first ask the question, when does the day begin? The Hebrew Scriptures record, and the Jewish people have faithfully observed that the day begins at sunset, not at the man-made hour of 12 o'clock midnight. The week begins at sunset at the end of the seventh day, the end of the Sabbath, the only day of the week which is named in the Bible. All other days are numbered. When the sun sets at the end of the Sabbath, it is the first day of the week. We read in the book of the Acts of the Jewish Apostles that the disciples got together early on the first day of the week to break bread. They did not get up early Sunday morning for a sunrise bacon and egg breakfast. They did what we still do in the land of Israel. As the sun begins to set at the end of the Sabbath, we gather in homes to share a meal with others in the community. We call it the third meal of the Sabbath. Everyone comes with something to share, food, a song, a teaching, a revelation from the scriptures. When the sun sets, it is early the first day of the week, and the fellowship often continues into the wee hours of the morning. It was after the third meal of Shabbat that Shaul started teaching, and about midnight, a sleepy young man fell out a third story window. Now, it is commonly taught among Gentiles that Shaul had been teaching for 18 hours since the 6 a.m. Sunday sunrise service. That is nonsense. Let's consider this scripture in the light of the culture in which it was written. After the third meal of Shabbat, early the first day of the week, the boy fell asleep during Shaul's long-winded sermon and plummeted to his death. Shaul, being somewhat responsible for killing the lad, prayed for him and he was raised from the dead. No one could go to sleep then, so they continued until sunrise, took Shaul to meet his boat, and then everyone went to work as usual on the first day of the work week, which was known in pagan cultures as the day of the sun, Sunday. That morning, the first day of the week, not moon day, the second day, Shaul and his company left for their next adventure. This was standard travel practice, which allowed as much time as possible, a full six days, to reach their destination before the next Shabbat. Let's face it, if we do not understand the Creator's reckoning of time, we can confuse the scriptures for an entire lifetime. Because the lunar cycle is approximately 29.530587 days long, there will not be a month that is longer than 30 days or shorter than 29. If for any reason the moon is not sighted by sunset at the end of the 30th day, by default it is declared to be the beginning of the month. The sighting of the new moon, which determines the Rosh Chodesh, the head of the month, is an event that must take place in the land of Israel, within a one-day walk of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a place from which the yearly and monthly calendar cycle is to be determined by those to whom it was entrusted, the children of Israel not Babylonian mathematicians. When the moon disappeared at the end of each month, everyone would watch the western horizon just above the setting sun for the first glimpse of the new moon. When it was sighted, men would rush up to the Temple Mount to certify the sighting. 
The first witnesses would normally arrive at night, but the gates to the temple were shut at sundown. They would stand at the gate and call out to the temple guard, we have sighted the new moon. The temple guard would verify that at least two witnesses were present before he summoned a member of the Sanhedrin, the judicial body of Israel. The Nasi, one of the ruling princes, would make diligent inquiry of the first two witnesses, and when the sighting was certain, he gathered the elders into the hall of hewn stones adjacent to the temple, and then alerted the high priest. The Kohen Gadol stood on the temple mount and cried out to the two witnesses below, Come up hither! Come up here! The gate swung open, and the two witnesses ascended the temple mount and appeared before the high priest and elders to declare their sighting of the new moon. When both witnesses gave the confirming evidence, the Kohen Gadol cried out, Sound the trumpets! The trumpets would blast from the Temple Mount, and the sentry posted across the Kidron Valley Bridge on the Mount of Olives would put his torch to a well-prepared stack of wood. A pillar of fire and a cloud of smoke ascended from the signal fire, and the sentry sounded his shofar to announce the Rosh Kodesh. From mountaintop to mountaintop throughout the land of Israel, the sentries saw the distant signal fires, and they lit their fire and blew their shofar to announce to the entire nation that the new month had begun. The first day of the seventh month is especially significant. The moment the trumpets sound, it initiates the high Sabbath of the Day of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. All work and commerce was immediately suspended, and everyone rushed to their homes and enrobed themselves in spotless white linen garments for the festival. If you had not purchased provisions and prepared your garments in advance, you would be left behind and shut out of the celebration. The Day of Trumpets occurs each year on a day and hour that no man knows. The men are in the fields reaping, and the women at the grindstone processing the fall harvest, right up to the moment that the trumpet sounds. Now you are beginning to understand the Messiah's words in the Gospel of Matthew and the importance of the two witnesses in the 11th chapter of Revelation. For three and a half years, two witnesses testify against the New World Order occupation of Israel, then they are executed. For three and a half days, their dead, bloating carcasses bake in the streets of Jerusalem. But in the middle of an earthquake, they rise to their feet, and out of the portals of heaven, the voice of the high priest cries out, Come up hither! Come up here! The two witnesses ascend through the gates of heaven and appear before the high priest and heavenly court to declare their sighting of the first sliver of the new moon. The Kohen Gadol, the Messiah himself, cries out, Sound the trumpets! And the angels respond, Now is the time that the righteous dead are raised and his servants and prophets are rewarded. And he will destroy those who have destroyed the earth. It is the fulfillment of Yom Teruah, the day of the awakening trumpets. We often see people that are trying to keep up with the latest fads and nutrition, diets, and complete wellness. What kinds of guidance can you give them? We know there's no shortage of diets to try or special herbs to take. I'd say that our biggest concern is knowing what types of diets to follow and how they affect the body during and afterward. There are plenty of diets out there that are not evidence-based. They will help you lose weight, but they'll also help you gain it back faster than you lost it. Likewise, vitamins are not all created equal. Some are great, others are completely useless. There are plenty of synthetic vitamins and vitamins that are not regulated. The key is to follow a diet that helps you to lose the bad fat and not the good fat and helps your body to keep the weight off. Take vitamins that are bioidentical and that the body recognizes as its own. Basic rule, if Jehovah didn't put it in our bodies, don't take it. To learn more about dieting and nutrition, go to www.arudeawakening.tv forward slash body, soul, spirit.
When does the year begin on the Creator's calendar? The day of trumpets in the seventh month cannot be observed properly if we have not accurately determined the first month of the year, and this requires another twofold witness. First, the barley must be of Eve. This barley, which was first planted here over 3,000 years ago by the priest of Israel, continues to reseed itself on the side of the Mount of Olives century after century. This is a location that we still check to find the Aviv barley each spring. The new moon immediately following the finding of the Aviv barley will be declared the Rosh Chodesh of the Aviv. After the Romans evicted the remaining tribes of the children of Israel from their land, the entire system of sighting and signaling the beginning of months and years was in disarray. A calculated calendar was invented in the fourth century which errs by three millionths of a day per month. After 1,600 years, the modern Jewish calendar is consistently off by a day or two, and depending on the Aviv, sometimes an entire month. Jewish scholars all agree that the original reckoning of time was based on the visible sighting of the new moon and the Aviv barley in the land of Israel, and there is one group that has remained faithful to that ancient practice, the Karaites. Nehemiah Gordon is a Karaite who lives in the land of Israel. He is a scholar an editor on the Dead Sea Scrolls publication project, and a consultant on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. Each spring, Nehemiah assembles an entourage of adventurers to traverse the land of Israel in search of the Aviv barley. The Torah commands us in Devarim, Shamor et Chodesh Ha'aviv ve'asita Pesach la'yobar lohecha. Keep the month of the Aviv barley and perform the Passover sacrifice to Yehovah, your God. We are also taught in Shemot, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, as I have commanded you, at the time of the month of the Aviv, because in the month of the Aviv you went out of Egypt. We are commanded to keep Chag HaMatzot, the feast of unleavened bread, in the month of the Aviv. The term Aviv is an ancient Hebrew agricultural term. The ninth chapter of Shemot relates that the barley in Egypt was destroyed by the plague of hail because the barley was in the ear, according to the King James translators, but in Hebrew, because the barley was aviv. So the question remains, what is aviv barley? The Hebrew Bible gives us three clues as to the meaning of the term aviv. The first clue is found in Vayikra, which says that aviv, parched in fire, was offered as a first fruits offering. To identify the meaning of aviv, we conduct a simple test to determine at what stage in the barley's development it can be parched in fire and still produce food. These tests have consistently shown that underdeveloped green ears of corn, as the King James Version reads, simply evaporate in the heat of the fire. The second clue, found in Shemot, informs us that the plague of hail in Egypt destroyed the barley crop because the barley was aviv, whereas the wheat and the spelt were not destroyed because they were in an earlier stage called dark. As grains ripen, they become lighter and more brittle. The term aviv refers to a stage in the barley's ripening by which time it has become light in color and brittle enough to be destroyed by falling hail. A simple test simulating the impact of falling hail can help us detect at what point the barley has become aviv. The third clue, found in Vayikra, teaches us that the wave sheaf offering brought during the Feast of Unleavened Bread must come from the first sheaf of the harvest. Devarim further clarifies that the wave sheaf offering is to be brought at such time as the sickle begins upon the standing grain. The barley must be aviv at the new moon, but ready for harvest 15 days later. These three witnesses all point to the same stage of maturity. When the seeds are firm, like soft cheese, they produce edible grain through parching. The stalks will be brittle enough to be damaged when struck by hail, and the grain will be harvestable in about two weeks' time. In ancient times, all Jews faithfully observed the month of the Aviv barley. This was done by inspecting the barley crops in the land of Israel at the end of the 12th month. The Book of Tehillim mentions these steps in the Shir Hamalot, the Songs of the Steps, sometimes translated as Songs of Degrees. It was on these very steps, the steps leading up to the Holy Temple, that the Aviv court convened to examine samples of barley and consider whether they had reached the stage in their ripening known as Aviv. If the barley was found to be Aviv, the next new moon would be declared the month of the Aviv. 
However, if the barley was not yet ripe enough, an announcement would be sent throughout the world that a 13th month had been added to the year. That was the practice at the time of the Second Temple. One ancient account tells of an actual Aviv announcement issued by the Pharisee leader, Gamliel I. That's the same Gamliel who was the teacher of Shaul. Gamliel was one of the most prominent Pharisees at the time of the Second Temple. The report reads, Gamliel was sitting on the steps of the Temple Mount, and he instructed his scribe Yochanan, write to our brethren, the exiles of Babylonia, and to those in Media, and to all the other exiled sons of Israel, saying, May your peace be great forever. We beg to inform you that the ripening of the Aviv has not yet arrived. It seems advisable to me and my colleagues to add a month to this year. Even after the destruction of the temple, all Israel continued to follow the true biblical calendar using the Aviv and the new moon to determine God's appointed times. But that changed in the year 359 of the Common Era. At that time, the Pharisee Hillel II invented a pre-calculated calendar to replace the true biblical calendar. Using ancient Babylonian mathematics, Hill established a 19-year cycle in which seven years would arbitrarily receive a 13th month. This invented cycle kept Passover at about the right time, but not necessarily in the month of the Aviv. This and other Pharisaic innovations eventually split the Jews into two camps, the Karaites and the Rabbinites. Nehemi, what is the meaning of the name Karaite? Karaite comes from the Hebrew word kara, which means Hebrew scriptures, sometimes called the Old Testament. The name Karaite literally means Hebrew scripturalist, and it was given to those Jews who had followed the Hebrew scriptures without addition or subtraction. And the Rabbinites? The Rabbinites, the descendants of the Pharisees, adopted the innovations of the rabbis laid down in the Talmud. The Rabbinites adopted the new calculated calendar of Hill II, while the Karaites remained faithful to the original Hebrew calendar. The determination of the Creator's seasons begins with the first grain to mature in the spring, the barley. Aviv 1 in the 6,001st year from creation begins the seventh millennium, the day or the millennium of the Lord. It also begins the time of Jacob's trouble, a time which will test the maturity of every follower of the Messiah. When the day of the Lord begins, will you have matured to the point that you will bear fruit when subjected to the test of fire? or will you just evaporate in the heat of tribulation? Many Christians plan to evaporate just before the test of maturity comes. If you are struck down when the hail of tribulation falls, will you have mature fruit that will reseed itself and continue to bear fruit? Or will you just moisten the earth with the perspiration of your own self-serving endeavors? These are tares. They look like barley, and while they are growing, you cannot tell them apart but at the time of the harvest you will know them by their fruits. Tares stand upright. They never bow their empty heads. They have no fruit to show for all the nutrients they consume. And like the rest of the chaff on the threshing floor, they will be burned with the refuse at the end of the harvest. But don't uproot them prematurely. You will invariably make the mistake of destroying true barley, which may be just a bit late in maturing. You cannot judge barley until the time of the harvest, and that job belongs to the angelic reapers. Each night, the moon tells us the day of the month. The Aviv barley tells us the beginning of the year. You don't need Babylonian mathematics to calculate planetary conjunctions or compile data from the National Astronomical Observatory. Just look for the Aviv barley in Israel once a year and the new moon once a month, and the celebration and fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord can be understood by a child. And if you don't happen to be in Israel, you will find this information through our website, arootawakening.tv. In upcoming episodes, we will take you on a journey into the Feast of the Lord so that you will see that these prophetic shadow pictures are the foundation of all Bible prophecy. The spring feast have been fulfilled to the very day and hour of their rehearsed times. And the fall feast will be fulfilled with the same accuracy, according to the Creator's time clock. I'm Michael Rood, inviting you to join us again next time for A Rood Awakening. And I'll see you when the smoke clears. <laughs>